Africa is known to have some of the world's best stargazing locations, but soon it could be also known for what's happening among the stars. The African Space Agency officially began operations earlier this year from its headquarters in Cairo. It aims to help existing space programs from individual countries collaborate as well as supercharge the continent's space ambitions. Africa is stepping into the sky, and the world didn't see it coming. For decades, space has been controlled by the same powerful nations America, Russia, China while Africa watched from the ground. But now everything is changing, quietly, rapidly, and shockingly. New satellites are rising, new launch plans are forming, new space agencies are taking shape across African nations. And suddenly, Washington is paying attention because this time, Africa isn't asking to join the game. It's entering it on its own terms. The U.S. once dominated satellite access for communication, mapping, security, and GPS across the continent. But that grip is loosening. Data control is shifting. Technology partnerships are changing. And the old power balance is starting to tilt. This isn't just about rockets, it's about who controls. Information, navigation, and the future of global technology. So the real question isn't whether Africa can reach space. The question is, what happens to global power when it does? For generations, space felt impossibly far away from Africa's daily reality. When people spoke about rockets and satellites, it sounded like a conversation meant for Washington, Moscow, or Beijing, not for Nairobi, Lagos, Accra, Addis Ababa, or Cape Town. Africa was portrayed as a spectator to humanity's greatest technological frontier. Dependent on foreign systems to communicate, map weather, track crops, guide airplanes, and secure borders. But something fundamental has shifted quietly, carefully, and largely outside the spotlight of mainstream media. Africa has begun building its own path into space and the implications stretch far beyond science or symbolism. This is about independence, digital power, security, economics, and future influence. It's about who decides. What the skies above Africa are used for foreign satellites or African ones. For decades, nearly every satellite service across Africa relied on foreign infrastructure, particularly American networks. Communications satellites beamed television signals, managed cell towers, transmitted military signals, handled disaster alerts, and supported high-resolution mapping almost entirely controlled by companies or government agencies based outside the continent. Licensing agreements, service contracts, leasing fees, and data access terms were decided in boardrooms thousands of miles away. African nations paid to use systems they didn't own and rarely controlled. This meant that Africa's digital nervous system everything from agriculture mapping to maritime navigation remained externally dependent. When prices rose or political tensions flared, access could be restricted, delayed, or reprioritized. It wasn't always malicious, but it wasn't truly sovereign either. As Africa's population surged and its digital economy expanded, the costs of this dependency became clearer. More students needed internet, farmers needed precise weather forecasts, governments needed mapping tools for urban planning, airlines required reliable navigation, militaries demanded secure communications, emergency agencies needed disaster monitoring systems. Each time Africa looked upward for solutions, the answer came with a price tag and with limitations on control. That's where the quiet shift began. Countries started asking a new question. Why are we renting the future instead of owning it? The earliest moves were modest. Nigeria launched NIGCOM Sat-1 to improve national communications. South Africa developed Earth observation satellites for environmental monitoring. Egypt, Kenya, Ethiopia, Morocco, Angola, Ghana, Rwanda, and Algeria joined international research programs or formed national space offices. Universities began space engineering programs. African scientists strained abroad not to work permanently overseas, but to bring skills home. Africa's first major collaborative breakthrough came when the African Union proposed forming the African Space Agency, officially launched to coordinate space research, satellite operations, and technology transfer across member states. For the first time, there was a unified continental goal, stop acting as fragmented data customers and start becoming space participants. By the early 2020s, African-built satellites began entering orbit every year mostly small observation satellites designed for real-world problem-solving rather than prestige missions. These satellites track drought patterns, monitor flooding zones, map illegal mining, estimate crop yields, monitor shipping routes, and help fight deforestation. This wasn't fantasy science, it was practical necessity. And it worked. In regions where foreign satellite imagery was expensive or delayed, governments now access near real-time data generated by African systems. Border monitoring became faster. Disaster responses became more targeted. Crop insurance programs gained accuracy. Universities gained their own research platforms instead of begging foreign agencies for limited data access windows. 
Slowly but unmistakably, Africa was building technological sovereignty, a word few headlines used, but one that shifted global perceptions, because sovereignty in space isn't symbolic, it's power. Space controls communication, space controls navigation, space controls surveillance, and space increasingly controls data ownership. The new global currency, as African nations launched more satellites and embraced alternative partnerships with countries beyond the traditional Western orbit, the U.S. noticed. Not because Africa was challenging American rocket capacity, it wasn't E, but because control of infrastructure was changing. American satellite companies that once held dominant contracts began facing competition from regional operators and new global players. Data previously rooted through U.S.-controlled systems could now pass. Through African-managed networks, commercial deals shifted toward consortia rather than single Western suppliers. Washington's concern wasn't e about Africa going to space, it was about losing uncontested access to regional telecommunications leverage. For decades, data pipelines mattered more than physical pipelines. Countries that control orbit also influence trade routing, military logistics coordination, disaster surveillance, maritime. Tracking and GPS-based positioning systems that guide entire economies. When nations rely on your satellites, they're inevitably bound to your oversight frameworks, compliance requirements, and policy terms. When they don't, the influence weakens. Africa stepping into satellite ownership meant optional alternatives that alone reshapes power dynamics. The ripple effects reached other global players, too. China expanded joint research stations and technology exchange programs. Europe deepened collaborative Earth observation projects. Russia offered training partnerships, India invested in low-cost satellite deployment collaborations. Africa no longer depended solely on any one external provider and that independence itself became strategic leverage. With bargaining power came confidence. African governments began rejecting exploitative contracts that demanded excessive data rights. They demanded local control hubs instead of off-continent ground stations. They insisted on technology transfer rather than simply leasing services. For the first time, African negotiators sat across the table not as dependent customers but as partners with increasing leverage, and that's precisely when the tone in foreign policy circles shifted. Western analysts began using words like sphere of influence erosion. U.S. military briefings discussed the geopolitical significance of space data competition over Africa. Lobbyists for telecom interests warned about contract losses linked to African satellite sovereignty. Meanwhile, African citizens barely noticed any of this because most of the work looked simple and local. Faster internet, better maps, stronger weather prediction, and improved emergency response systems. What the people felt was progress. What policymakers abroad felt was displacement. But there is another layer rarely discussed openly and it might be the most important one of all. Africa's space ambitions aren't driven by prestige or power rivalry. They're driven by survival, on a continent disproportionately impacted by climate change. Satellites directly support flood forecasting, drought management, wildfire, detection and food production planning. Millions of lives depend on early disaster warnings. Africa doesn't want Mars flags, it wants survival tools. Satellite mapping helps urban governments regulate expanding megacities. Telecom satellites bring internet to rural regions where cables will never reach economically. Remote education platforms allow medical schools to teach villages separated by thousands of kilometers. This isn't billion-dollar grandiosity, it's infrastructure modernization. Yet global observers interpret it through old lenses as rivalry and dominion politics. The tension builds because the system is changing. Africa is no longer waiting for permission to advance technologically. Historically, global power structures leaned on one central assumption, that advanced systems would always be for unowned. Local regions received services not influence. Now that assumption is breaking apart. Even more disruptive is the involvement of young African engineers across universities in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. Students are building CubeSats, experimenting with propulsion designs and programming ground communication systems. Many could easily leave and secure Western jobs, but a growing number stay. They see opportunity where previous generations saw limitation. African innovation ecosystems are forming around satellite research hubs. Startups specialize in remote imaging, AI climate modeling, and precision agriculture driven by space-based data. This ecosystem wasn't predicted but once it ignited, it spread rapidly. As Africa's digital sector grows, the need for independent satellite infrastructure expands alongside it. Data centers under construction across Kenya and South Africa pair synergy with space assets. National telecom expansions depend increasingly on non-U.S. satellite partnerships. For Washington, the concern is less dramatic than media headlines suggest but still real. The U.S. no longer enjoys uncontested leadership over regional digital infrastructure, where once American companies defined standards and pricing, now they compete. And competition means influence loss.
Other powers have studied this path carefully. China observed how satellite partnerships generate political goodwill and economic ties. India recognized the value of affordable launch cooperation to deepen relations. Europe sees Africa as a research partner critical to climate science. Africa benefits from these rival interests because each side bids for cooperation instead of dictation. This multipolar competition serves African interests far better than unilateral dependence ever did. The irony is that Africa's actions are not hostile, they are stabilizing. Distributed infrastructure reduces single system vulnerabilities. Local control reduces blackout risks. Regional ownership improves response times for disasters. And security monitoring. But in a world accustomed to asymmetric reliance, independence itself becomes seen as disruption. As Africa steps further into the final frontier, the question isn't whether it can succeed it already is. The real question is how global power structures adapt to a continent that no longer seeks permission to modernize and no longer relies on one nation as technology to do so. Africa's space journey is still young. Nothing close to human launches or prestige missions is imminent, but what it symbolizes is far more powerful than rockets. It symbolizes control over communication, data, climate intelligence, security, and education, the pillars of modern sovereignty. The sky above Africa is no longer borrowed space, it is becoming African-owned. Territory of innovation. And that reality not fear of competition is what makes some foreign capitals uneasy. Because once control shifts above the clouds, it never fully returns to the ground. Look at the sky over Africa tonight. For countless generations, that same sky watched as the continent was mapped by outsiders, its lands surveyed by foreign instruments, its resources measured by satellites owned by distant powers. The stars above witnessed a story written largely without African voices decisions made thousands of miles away about African airspace, African data and African futures. But now something poetic is happening. That same sky is beginning to listen to new voices rising from below. Voices of young engineers soldering tiny satellites. In university labs. Voices of farmers using home-built space data to predict train instead of praying for it. Voices of students who are growing up knowing that space is not a forbidden frontier it as a career path. This isn't about beating America or challenging the world's superpowers. Africa isn't chasing dominance, it's chasing dignity. For the first time in modern history, Africa is refusing to remain only the subject of observation. It's choosing to become an observer itself, and that shift changes everything. Because when you control your data, you control your destiny. When you guide your navigation systems, you secure your borders, your skies, and your trade routes. When you see your land from orbit through your own satellites, you tell your own environmental. Story not someone else's filtered version of it. This isn't just technological achievement, it's emotional liberation. For young Africans who once felt trapped by dependency narratives, space represents something new, permission to dream without limits. A 14-year-old girl in Lagos studying physics doesn't he have to imagine leaving home to chase aerospace work. The work may soon come to her. A Kenyan engineering student no longer wonders if Africa will ever build complex systems she watches her classmates do exactly that. A South African coder doesn't just design apps. He programs satellite systems that circle the planet. This is confidence in motion. Space ambition turns into self-belief. Self-belief turns into innovation. Innovation turns into power not military power but sovereignty power. The power to make decisions without pressure. The power to choose partnerships instead of accepting dependencies. The power to stand at the negotiating table as equals. And that's why this moment matters more than headlines suggest. Not because the US feels uneasy, not because geopolitics is shifting, but because something deeper is unfolding. Africa is learning to trust its own capability. For a continent historically told to wait for help, this is revolutionary. Africa's greatest challenge was never science or engineering, it was belief, belief that global technology leadership could grow from African soil. Belief that African youth deserved to shape advanced industries rather than only serve them. Belief that the future could be engineered locally instead of imported. And now that belief is real. Every satellite launched, every research lab opened, every student trained sends a message into orbit. We build our own future now. The world will continue to debate power shifts and global influence. Analysts will argue about fears and losses, but above those arguments rises a simpler truth Africa's rise is not about replacing anyone. It's about standing beside everyone. Space belongs to all humanity, and Africa, long grounded by circumstance, is finally lifting into that shared human sky with confidence. No longer watching history unfold from the sidelines but actively writing it among the stars. And as the continent reaches upward, the most important transformation isn't happening in orbit. It's happening inside the hearts of millions of young Africans discovering for the first time that the limit is no longer above them, it's behind them.